AYMPT Facebook page and also the YouTube channel, the Instagram, the Twitter handle, all four social media platforms. Exclusively they are hosting the free webinars. It's not just one or two free webinars, it is 100 free webinars. As a Century Webinarathon, launched by AYMPT from 1st December 2020 to 31st March 2021. So, it's always a great uh, moment to meet all of you as it uh, is permitted by the internet. Of course, the webinar number 15 is the differential diagnosis of shoulder pain for which this session is going to uh, mainly emphasize on. As always, remember that the four social media platforms, all four platforms you need to have registered accounts. Everything is free of course. And the next step is you should like and follow all the AOMPT's social media platforms so that you get notifications whenever I am live or it is new posted there. The webinar if it is live on one platform the videos will be put on YouTube and the links will be shared in the other platforms. You are supposed to comment and all the platforms, four platforms and you are supposed to submit the screenshot to me. So every webinar has a four screenshots which you submit to me for the e-certificate. Okay, E-certificate is provided only for people who are registered with me by submitting their identity proofs. Okay, uh, AOMPT members, they need not submit identity proofs. They just have to tell that they wish to register. Okay? Registration is only once and under webinars, any of the webinar you can complete. You can complete at your own convenience. Okay? But don't be in a hurry that uh, you know you complete it one week later and then you ask for certificate within one minute. Okay, so always be um, aware that you should be well within your professional limits. Okay, you will get your e-certificates the moment you have submitted the four screenshots. E-certificates will be issued in terms of uh, uh, four or five webinars together. Okay. So for example, 9, 10, 11, 12, they'll be issued together, all four. So people who have attended all the four will get the first. So remember that uh, certificates will be issued first for people who have attended all the five together. Okay. If people have attended only one webinar, they'll be issued after the five, four, three, two, and then one. Okay. So you should have the patience to wait for it. And it might take maximum two, three days, that's all. Okay. So, but remember that all the four screenshots per webinar is mandatory. So, we are having uh, interruptions here again. So, what we anticipate is the next interruption. After that, I will start the webinar on Instagram. Okay. So, just stay tuned. So, remember the procedures which I described for the e-certificate and uh, follow them. Don't miss the 100 e-certificates, which is totally free. Okay, so coming to shoulder pain, to webinar number 15, differential diagnosis of shoulder pain. I have given the initial terms and conditions of all this webinar -athon and uh, e-certificates just now on Facebook. And uh, remember that every participants and viewers of this free webinars, the 100 free webinars, don't miss your chance to receive this e-certificate from AYMPT for absolutely free. Okay, so please register on WhatsApp and then you get in tune with the uh, tasks so that you get certified. Coming to this series is a unique series because 10 uh, webinars on uh, 10 regions of musculoskeletal differential diagnosis. Um, why differential diagnosis is important is because uh, for interdisciplinary communication and also for first contact practice. We are going to see shoulder pain. So first and the foremost, uh, what we actually see for differential diagnosis is the somatic versus visceral. Although it's a well established fact that left shoulder pain arises from cardiac origin or the right shoulder pain which can come from a gallbladder origin, both are which is visceral. And uh, of course, the next of this causes in shoulder pain, when you come to somatic first, is always the origin from the cervical spine. Okay, so cervical spine or thoracic spine can refer the pain to the shoulder. 
the pain in the shoulder is reproduced upon movement testing or muscle testing of the neck during that the shoulder pain is reproduced okay or even it could be a foraminal compression test uh, for radiculopathy for example okay so that shooting pain can come till the shoulder okay so always what you see here is a regional interdependence plus a referred pain or radicular pain from cervical spine to the shoulder and then of course the thoracic spine to the shoulder whenever uh, you are finding the shoulder pain to have what is called as not just in the shoulder but it is also there in the elbow also there in wrist and hand always think about more diffuse pathologies first and foremost i will like to identify whether other side any any problems are there okay so if it is bilateral and if it is diffuse okay both the sides and its multiple regions i would suspect neurological which is cervical myelopathy okay and then uh, coming to the peripheral neuropathies okay complex regional pain syndromes which are involved with the autonomic uh, nervous system dysfunctions peripheral vascular diseases okay mostly in the upper limb uh, thromboangitis obliterans because of uh, smoking for example okay the burgers disease can come vascular reynards disease is another variant of thromboangitis obliterans it's also an arterial disorder so all this occurs in uh, you know bilateral multi regional and all that brachial plexus injury mostly is unilateral and it is predominantly neurological like sensory motor and reflex diminished there could be autonomic symptoms only one side and uh, of course nerve conduction study is the gold standard for diagnosis when you talk about thoracic outlet syndrome or you talk uh, the subtypes of thoracic outlet syndrome there is one type called as pectoralis minor syndrome which is closely related to the shoulder complex uh, because it actually affects the scapular position okay the scapular type 1 dyskinesis okay inferior angle being prominent so pectoralis minor syndrome is closely associated with the shoulder pain and symptoms which is nocturnal okay where the patient lies down on the side and then gets what is called as uh, the hands are not present okay dead arm syndrome okay so there's no blood circulation going to the hands uh, because the patient lies down on that side okay so it's a characteristic feature of pectoralis minor syndrome coming to unilateral but multiple regions uh, as a complication of neurological uh, cerebrovascular accidents we have the shoulder hand syndrome okay which is nothing but the complex regional pain syndrome it's another uh, nomenclature has been modified reflex sympathetic dystrophy all of them are included under the complex regional pain syndrome okay either type 1 or type 2 type 2 which is the nerve injury of course nerve injury is like median nerve injury ulnar nerve injury or radial nerve injury can create shoulder and then distal symptoms it could be entrapment neuropathy is of axillary nerve and in the quadrilateral space space syndrome or it could be the ulnar nerve entrapment because of a uh, inferior uh, dislocation or instability anterior instability or dislocations can uh, affect the median nerve and posterior dislocations are uh, saturday night palsy okay the spiral groove entrapment of the radial nerve we know the innervation for median nerve always we check the thumb okay thinar muscles and the innervation for the thumb sensory and if you see for ulnar you always check the little finger and uh, the hypothenar and the intrinsic muscles intrase and the lumbricals okay so differential diagnosis also includes the neurodynamic tests where ulnt1 ulnt2 okay both are for median nerve ulnt3 is for the radial nerve and 4 is for the ulnar nerve okay so remember that palpation will also tell now palpation will differentiate between the Uh, major nerves of the upper limb when you are talking about musculoskeletal which is uh, you know soft tissues and then you see for bony problems i want to rule out the bony problem first most importantly fractures for example commonest fracture in the shoulder okay fall on outstretched hand which usually causes the fracture clavicle 
okay? lateral one third and the medial two third junction of the clavicle. Okay? It is uh, high rates of non-union okay? uh, because this is endochondral and this is intramembranous. Okay? Two types of ossification. So clavicle is the only bone which has both the types of ossification. So it never unites. Sometimes the strapping is done and after that we accept the non-union and then we start mobilizing the shoulder. Okay? Surgical definitely if it is a um, contraindications are ruled out patient is operated. So that's the most commonest outstretched hand because that is the mechanism commonly which happens. Of course surgical neck of the humerus fracture is another uh, which can occur next. Scapular fractures are very rare and also you see other fractures like um, um, trauma can produce other than fractures it can produce a minimal fracture with an instability okay so that could be even attachment of the long head of biceps okay and the labrum glenoidal labrum which is around the glenoid cavity so there also it could be anteriorly margin of the glenoidal labrum so from there it is detached with the bony lesion that is called as the Bankart's lesion. Bankart's lesion causes anterior instability. Okay. Similar way posteriorly, postero superior, that is the Hillsack's lesion. And Hillsack's lesion causes the posterior, posterior instability. So anterior instability, the typical mechanism of injury is abduction external rotation. Whereas the posterior instability, it is the adduction and internal rotation. So abduction external rotation means anterior instability, adduction internal rotation means posterior instability. Of course with a posterior push, uh, with an anterior push it could uh, aggravate the situation. Okay. After this of course dislocations inferior, it is actually occurs in two situations. One is post traumatic, if the person's arm is stuck and then uh, you know body weight is getting uh, displaced in a different direction or if an object is falling from the head or something from uh, top and a person is keeping the hand so the whole arm goes down okay inferior dislocation that is called as laxatia erecta okay that is traumatic hyper abduction okay hyper abduction syndrome will also cause uh, inferior dislocation very rare sports injuries, hyperabduction syndromes. And then next you see for inferior instability mostly is atraumatic. The other nomenclature for that is multidirectional instability. So there it is uh, what is called as paralysis, neuromuscular disorders. Okay, You have a polio which is affecting the upper limb or multiple sclerosis. You have stroke, the flaccid stage, shoulder subluxation happens. That is inferior direction. So remember that the inferior direction when it's subluxed, it's mostly managed conservatively. Whereas anterior or posterior, mostly it's called as unidirectional instabilities. They are managed surgically so that faster they can be rehabilitated. However, conservative recovery is also good except for the lesions like bank arts and the hill sacs. Otherwise, if it is just as a hypermobility or an instability, subluxation, it's fine. But if it is dislocation, that might require close reduction uh, under manipulation under anesthesia or it could be a surgical reduction. Surgical reduction can be laser uh, thermal, electrothermally assisted capsulography. The capsule uh, is uh, folded and then it is uh, reorganized in order to make it tight. Okay, Iatrogenically, we are creating a capsular tightness so that the instability won't occur. Okay. Posterior instability is not specifically after trauma, adduction, internal rotation. It is mostly because of powerful contraction of the posterior muscles. Especially like uh, that uh, muscles which are attached to you know, lower part there posteriorly. Like infraspinatus, teres minor, all those groups. So what happens here is a powerful electric shock will create a posterior dislocation. And also even... Um, what is called as uh, scissors, okay, the fits, attacks, okay, epileptic attacks that also causes posterior dislocation of the shoulder. So patients who have this kind of history, 
and they have uh, what is called as symptoms in the posterior aspect. Of course, anterior draws test, posterior draws test, apprehension, relocation test. You know, this is posterior drawers. So various tests which are special tests and differential diagnosis, you have the full demonstration and videos from AYMPT which you can purchase for your in-depth understanding and clear clinical correlation. Okay. So think about this instability. Also, I have already told you the differences between hypermobility to instability to subluxation and dislocation. And that always comes for everything. And then after that, the direction comes anterior, posterior and inferior. Next one is traumatic or atraumatic comes. Okay, that is because instability can be traumatic or atraumatic. So the next, it is the last one comes with associated injuries, which is bony injuries like bank arts, ill sacs or laxatia erecta. Okay. So that is one spectrum, instability one, where the patients complain with clicks, patients complain with giving way sensation. My arm is not in my control. When I'm moving towards one direction, suddenly it gets stuck. I'm not able to move after that. And then I suddenly I shake and after that I find, okay, or uh, I'm not able to return back to the original position if it is dislocation, okay? So that's a description which is typically given by the subjects. When you are seeing for restriction of range of motion, of course, every injury, every pain in the shoulder initially will be involved with restricted range, mainly because of the protective spasm. This situation can happen in bursa inflammation like subacromial bursitis. It could happen in rotator cuff tear, okay, the four tendons, if they are going for a tear, accompanied with the spasm. These two conditions specifically have a presentation of nocturnal pain, the night pain. So if a patient tells that my shoulder is paining in the night, you ask them a question. Did the pain make you to wake up from sleep? Does it disturb your sleep? If it is associated with sleep disturbance and it is not associated with change of positions, okay, they lie down on this side or they lie down straight or they lie down any position the pain is going to trouble them. If that is the case, you have got it that it's either the bursitis or the rotator cuff tear. Okay. A rotator cuff tear, you know it is a muscles. So it's the subscapularis which has to be tested. Again, that is positive tenderness, lesser tubercle. Supraspinatus, which is again to be tested like empty can. Subscapularis can be tested with belly press or the lift off test or uh, even uh, reverse uh, empty can. Okay, uh, supraspinatus, which can be tested by the empty can test. Of course, palpation, greater tubercle. And infraspinatus, it is the position of flexion and then the external rotation, the muscle testing. And then with the palpation of posterior inferior portion of the greater tubercle. Teres minor is further more inferior. That's again external rotation in the neutral position. Okay, so it's a muscle action. Rotator cuff tears have a characteristic feature of what is called as eccentric. That is you are raising the arm and then when you are lowering, they cannot control, they cannot hold the bone. So what will happen is there will be a drop arm sign, okay, called man's drop arm sign, okay. So that's again characteristic of rotator cuff tears. If there is a partial tear, it will be accompanied with a spasm. The spasm can be in any of the larger other muscles. Okay, don't think that it will be in the rotator cuff itself. And then the next one, of course, the bursa it is. Subacromial bursa, subdeltoid bursa. Okay, the same bursa extends. And when you extend and keep it behind like this, the bursa below the acromion comes to just anterior to the acromion. So when you palpate just next to the acromion, you are palpating actually the subacromial bursa. Normally it won't be tender, but if you give pressure, it will be tender. This bursa, this is actually the push button sign. Okay, Subacromial push button sign. When you are doing that, the pain also displaces anteriorly because the bursa is you know shifting anteriorly. Bursa is a synovial sac, okay, so it's to prevent friction. It is getting inflamed only because of narrowing of the subacromial space or already an inflammation of supraspinatus tendinitis or rotator cuff tendinitis. Okay. 
If the disease conditions can coexist also, rotator right? cuff tear or tendinitis with subacromial bursitis can coexist. So don't think that you got bursitis, so you are diagnosed. Okay. Try to see that what are the pathomechanically interrelated structures. And try to rule them out. Okay. If there is one medial rotator which is having a myofascial trigger points, like subscapularis, check the other medial rotators right from pectoralis major. Lattice must dorsi, teres major, okay, anterior deltoid, even coracobrachialis. Okay, so all the medial rotators you have to rule out. Okay, and if it is one lateral rotator which is having a trigger point, like for example teres minor, you have to check the infraspinatus and supraspinatus. Should also see posterior deltoid, and remember that inferiorly the muscles, tendons, whichever is there is adductors. Whereas superiorly, which is there, is the abductors, okay, in the shoulder. And uh, after the deltoid does the abduction, the upper trapezius takes over for the scapula. So scapular uh, dynamics is also another common uh, issue. When you see in shoulder pain patients who have restriction of shoulder movements, they tend to move the scapula more. Okay, it's like a compensation. So you need this is a reverse scapula humeral rhythm. So you might see that the scapula is elevating more rather than the lateral rotation which comes. Okay, the usual sequence is arm is abduction after that lateral rotation of scapula. Okay, in the reversed scapula humeral rhythm, first is the elevation of the scapula, then you have an abduction. Okay, the abduction stops at hundred; it won't go beyond that because yourself also you just see that normal position of scapula, you will be able to lift fully. But if you elevate the scapula, after that you see it won't go beyond 90 okay this is because of the active insufficiency okay of the interrelationship between upper trapezius and the deltoid okay what you see here is you know when you see for trigger points usually these trigger points come in situations of the third category of diagnosis in shoulder that is the impingement syndromes tendinitis okay simple bursitis it could come so you have to do the individual muscle testing and you have to do the palpation the surface anatomical landmarks in the shoulder so that you can clearly diagnose of course what is our priority is functional because patient has a functional issue we have to train them for functional activities so do not actually restrict their activity unless there is a documented tear or it is a post-operative patient within the three weeks even one week only till the stitches if there is a attack of repair or uh, uh, reconstructions okay so remember that you should be clear of what you are actually doing to okay in the impingement syndrome secondly acromioclavicular joint arthritis is another reason why the impingement syndrome can happen Acromioclavicular joint pain is actually at the superior aspect of the shoulder which is aggravated by the compression test anterior and posterior also by the horizontal adduction also by accessory movements of the lateral end of the clavicle associated with the crepitus so acromioclavicular joint arthritis is very easy to diagnose treatment is again mobilization of the joint uh, strapping and you might go for local uh, therapy like even ultrasound, therapeutic ultrasounds. Sternoclavicular joint isolated involvement is very rare but if it is involved remember that sternoclavicular joint and acromioclavicular joint con uh, no, constitutes 30 degree in the total 180 degrees of elevation, 30 degree only. Scapula contributes together with sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular, scapula, thoracic, all the three contribute 60 degrees in the 180 degrees. 120 degrees is from glenohumeral. So depending on the range of uh, restriction, we can hypothesize whether it will be only involvement of glenohumeral or it is involvement of other joints also. The next of course in differentiation in um, AYMPD, there is a differentiation based approach where we highlighted that you can differentiate whether it is a so scapulothoracic is primarily involved or glenohumeral is involved or sternoclavicular is involved or acromioclavicular is involved. So which one to treat first? Okay, that you can diagnose. So remember that 
that only gives the treatment plan because in a chronic presentation all patients will present with multiple joint stiffness you should pick up which is the primary okay mostly if acromioclavicular is primary you have to mobilize the acromioclavicular first um, the symptom may be present in glenohumeral that is as an impingement okay Impingement usually happens in two tissues. One is the supraspinatus tendon, other one is the long head of biceps. <coughs> the coracoid impingement, subcoracoid impingement, it can happen at the short head of biceps. Okay. So coracoid impingement, what you do is internal rotation and horizontal reduction. Okay. It's like a slap uh, prehension test. Superior labral tear, anterior to posterior. That is long headed. And uh, you have this test for that. Otherwise for impingement is internal rotation and uh, flexion or you flex it to 120 and then you internally rotate. So either the Nears test or the Hawkins test, Hawkins Kennedy for the impingement signs. Characteristic differentiation between impingement and uh, frozen shoulder for example, the restriction range of motion restriction is impingement syndrome don't have range of motion restriction and impingement syndrome has characteristically painful arc. So when you are abducting, you will get a pain and then after that no pain, okay. So that clearly tells about it's an impingement syndrome. Syriax actually explained that the tendon superior surface, if it is uh, inflamed, it will pain in the end range. Under surface is uh, inflamed, <coughs> it will pain as an arc. If the within substance inflammation of tendon is there, pain will be there throughout the range of motion. Okay, full range of motion. <coughs> and if there is a muscular tendinous versus tenoperiosteal, okay, remember that myofascial trigger point is in the muscle belly, then muscular tendinous junction inflammation, tendon inflammation, tendinitis, tendinosis, tenosynovitis, tenovaginitis, okay, tendon partial tear, tendon complete tear, and calcific tendinitis. Okay, all are tendon injuries. Tenoperiosteal combines with the calcific tendinitis and avulsion fractures, okay, tenoperiosteal junctions. So make sure that sometimes in javelin throwers, you know, forceful contraction, sometimes in pole vault, okay, these ports, there can be avulsion fractures, okay, greater tubercle. So what you see here in the differential diagnosis, the last one is the frozen shoulder, okay. Remember that it's an idiopathic restriction of the range of motion of the shoulder. It could be because of any causes. If you find that there is osteoarthritis of the shoulder, it's not frozen shoulder. Okay, it's a separate disorder. Osteoarthritis involves the damage to the articular cartilage okay, of the shoulder. It's predominantly post-traumatic. So after a fall or a minor injury to the joint, late stages it becomes osteoarthritis. Okay, degeneration and joint space, all this. Frozen shoulder. It is characteristic restriction and this restriction goes through stages, painful stage, um, freezing stage, frozen stage and thawing stage, okay, different, different uh, progressions. Self-resolving, in some patients the range of motion might return to normal, in some patients it just gets arrested in the middle with the range of motion restrictions till the patient is functionally independent, okay. So it's a very wide spectrum, even now. The exact cause of frozen shoulder is not established. Previous terminologies that were related to the frozen shoulder were the adhesive capsulitis, which is actually confirmed on arthroscopy. So unless you perform arthroscopy, you cannot say there is adhesions between the capsule layers. Okay. Periarthritis shoulder is a very vague term. Every structure outside the shoulder joint inflammation is periarthritis. That means tendinitis, bursitis, Acromioclavicular joint arthritis, everything comes under periarthritis. Okay. Neural entrapments we have seen, we have seen the vascular and we have also seen the tendons, bursa and then the what is called as the related joints of the shoulder and how we are going to characterize it into three categories. One is the frozen shoulder category or the hypomobile category. Other one is the inflammation category that is the impingement syndrome and then the instability category, which is actually unidirectional or multidirectional. Okay, so that's where the regional differential diagnosis comes. But if you are seeing for 
interdependence, uh, you need to rule out the cervical thoracic and its influence. Peripheral neuro neurological disorders, complication of neurological disorders, all should be ruled out. Of course, visceral, that is in the first level screening. Okay. So that's the overview of the differential diagnosis of the shoulder. I'm looking forward to the queries from the participants so that if I could answer it live now. Okay. Uh, participants can put those queries in the comments so that uh, I can read them and try to see how much I can make you to understand. Okay. So I definitely recommend all of you. It's not because it's my videos, so I recommend. Uh, you should give a try on purchasing the 260 videos. Anatomy, Biomechanics, Physical Examination and Differential Diagnosis of Cervical Spine, Lumbar Spine, Scapula, Shoulder, Elbow, Wrist and Hand, Pelvis, Hip, Knee, Foot and Ankle. Okay, All videos are explicitly the teaching videos, demonstration videos of me and uh, which I regularly teach for my undergrads and uh, my postgraduate students. Okay, So it's a very very valuable resource. I would definitely suggest that participants can purchase that videos, get the certificates, e-certificate for those videos also and it will be a very valuable reference resource lifelong, okay, especially anatomy, it's a functional anatomy and uh, surface anatomy with palpation and you see biomechanics which is integrating pathomechanics. Okay. So I'm just looking forward to see if any of you have any questions. So I'm waiting for you guys to put the queries in the comment, okay? Don't send me request to join live on the screen, okay? Uh, maybe for AOMPT members who are uh, senior members, committee members, those who have completed more than 10 um, webinar packages, that is more than 100 webinars, they have participated in this lockdown. Definitely I can give them the opportunity to come live on the screen directly ask me. Okay. Other people please feel free to type in your questions as comments. Okay. So I'll wait for another 10 seconds and see if I get anything. If there are no queries then we close the session for today. The differential diagnosis of shoulder pain. Okay. Okay, so see you all, wish you very good luck and uh, enjoy your time. I, what I am uh, now thinking of is uh, just to start, start with the differential diagnosis of elbow pain, okay, which I am going to start within uh, 10 minutes, okay, so good luck to you all.